into the life, love, and the pursuit of FI podcast with your host Austin Culp and Gregory Gaskin. What's happening, man? Hey, man, how are you? Oh, I'm doing well, man. How you doing? Good. Oh, it's been a long day. <laughs> yeah, so this this is the first episode of Life, Love, and the Pursuit of FI podcast. This is officially our pilot episode. Are you, re- are you yeah. ready? <laughs> I am. This is where we get all the kinks <laughs> knocked out and we make this happen. All right. So for those new listeners out there, which everyone will be, <laughs> uh, <laughs> why, why start a podcast? Well, that's a great question. You know, I think that it really depends on what you believe you bring value into the world and what information you want to share with others. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah, I was I was surprised when you asked me to to co-host with you. I was like, oh, I was just planning on doing like helping out the background stuff, but being in front of the <laughs> yeah. camera, I'm like, all right, let's let's do it. Let's get our let's get our feet wet. Yeah, you know, a lot of people know us both, so I think that co-hosting is a great opportunity to be able to, for us to both, you know, work together. Also, like, the the different aspects of, like, our backgrounds. So it's, like, a good mix to have two, uh, two guys from different parts of the country <laughs> and two completely different um, backgrounds, and we're both single. So I also feel like that's a perspective of FI that doesn't get talked about as much. Cause like all the information that gets provided to people is based on like married filed jointly numbers or just from like a married perspective or recently divorced. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, we'll, we'll get to those episodes in the future where we bring in people who have been married and pursuing FI. Um, And it's it's also great because you and I are both young and we have all those compounding years ahead of us. Yeah. And uh, like you said, you know, we come from two very different backgrounds and cultures. And I think it's great to get both of our expertise in in this podcast. Yeah. And it's also nice to have people who are still like pursuing FI and not like people who have already done it and then they're telling you how they did it. It's like, a hey, this is what I'm doing in the moment. And this is what my mess ups are. And then they can get in like, we can do like a weekly update segment if we want about how our journey is going as we um, progress. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, have you ever had a friend that you're trying to explain fire to and you're just like, you know, you, you have to keep typing out like what <laughs> what financial independence stands for, you know? And all of that, now you can just go to a podcast and people can learn about it. Yes, I hate doing that. I oh, also hate the questions about people ask me all the time. Oh, how do you do such and such? You're so lucky. Like, no, I'm not. I'm intentional about everything I do. <laughs> They're like, oh, you travel so much. How do you do? Well, I live in a modest house. No, I have money invested and i don't well one i don't have kids because everyone i work with is all like married with children so they they say they live through me <laughs> with my adventures <laughs> i and you know to, to that same point you know i i get asked that a lot you know with my traveling and it's just you know if, if you're smart about where you put your money you know you, you can really spend it on what matters to you in life but i think that's probably like the biggest most important thing is you know you're spending your money on stuff that matters to you because you know we don't know if we're going to be around next week in the next hour right we have no idea so i think it's it's important to remember that you know phi is it's about finding the value and what you value in your life absolutely so for the people who are new what exactly is financial independence uh, let's see what what's your what would be your personal definition of financial independence. You know, a lot of people that 
there are a few different definitions of financial independence. I, I think that, you know, when you're able to live off of the investments that you've invested over your working years or that you might have inherited, you know, there are many different ways that that could come into play. But, you know, you have enough money to where you can retire off of the 4% rule, which now a lot of people believe, you know, with a lot of factors going into the future, it might be less than 4% that you can, you know, safely retire off of. But I, I really think that it depends on your, you know, your risk profile. But financial independence to me is being able to pursue the life that I want without having to worry about the money. Uh, what about to you? Nice. So financial independence for me is just having the security to be able to do what you want when you want without having to answer to like any specific person like whether it be like a job or something like that right so if you want to pick up and go to shoot, Costa Rica <laughs> which I will be going very soon uh, but if you want to go to you know anywhere you can just pick up go you don't have to call off you don't have to do any of that so that is what yeah. I plan on doing I also think you know you're in a way you're buying back your time you know you're buying back time in your life to, to do the things you want to do hmm. yes all right and for those who don't like our definitions <laughs> uh, financial independence uh, the as the technical definition of it is having enough income to pay your living expenses for the rest of your life without having to be employed and on others so for people who don't know what the four percent rule is do we want to explain how that came about yeah yeah absolutely so <clears throat> in my own definition the way that i i like to best explain it to people is let's say the the market returns eight to nine percent a year you know like index funds and you're able to have eight to nine percent of your annualized, and then you are able to take four percent of your portfolio and live off of it, and then take the other four to five percent, whatever it might be, and let that grow within the market so that you are never having to draw down your entire portfolio in retirement. So rough numbers, you know, the numbers that everyone usually goes with is if you have a million dollars and you live off four percent, that's forty thousand. And then you still have that four to five percent in the market that is growing at that same rate and compounding over time. Absolutely. I love it. So awesome. Let's talk about the fire journey. How is how did you get started with fire? Yeah, absolutely. So I was about 18 coming out of the, the military at the time. No, I wasn't 18. I was uh, 21 coming out of the military, and I was living paycheck to paycheck, and my credit score was just horrible, man. I had, like, a, I think at the time, like, a 400 credit score. Oh, like, wow. It was bad. <laughs> <laughs> so when I was 18, I defaulted my first car loan just because, you know, I had no concept of what, what it was to manage my finances. Wait, what car was it? Uh, it was a 2012 Chevy Sonic. Oh, all right. So I was like, it could have been like a, you know, a, tra a Challenger, Mustang, Camaro. <laughs> no, it was it was a Chevy Sonic. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's a lot of stereotypes about people in the military <laughs> buying those types of cars. It's very, very true. It's absolutely true. Um, <laughs> they'll finance it for like 22, like annual percentage, like a year. And they don't realize, you know, they just see enough. All they think is like, oh, I'm going to get this car and here's my monthly payment. They don't think about the interest rate at all. And so I was 21 leaving the army and I was living paycheck to paycheck. And I was just like, you know, this can't be sustainable. And then I was like, what do wealthy people know that I can't figure out? So like I started researching and eventually I found Our Rich Journey, which is a YouTube channel that yeah. kind of helped me get into where I am today um it's great channel and then absolutely 
And then I found the simple path of wealth. And then after reading that from JL Collins, um, I found fire Facebook groups, uh, including this one group called Singles in Pursuit of Financial Independence. Uh And it's a great group. I mean, great individuals there from different mindsets, different backgrounds. And and ever since then, I've, I've been learning a lot and, you know, continually learning. Um, but what about you? How did you find fire? Uh, all right. So my fire journey was kind of completely by accident. Uh, well, first I had a friend who invited me to, you know, the choose a fire group. I had, I had no interest in the fire movement. Like I was like, I don't understand this at all, but he invited me to it. Like, all right, I'll check it out. Right. So I was in a group for like two years. Never looked at a post. Never, <laughs> never did anything. But I always like watch different money podcasts or like YouTube channels while at work. Uh, just because, you know, you know, typical desk job, you need some background noise to like get you through the day. And so I I started with um, the Money Guy Show. They, because those two guys are hilarious. And then uh, when the pandemic started, is when I actually started, you know, focusing on, you know, my finances. Because like I was seeing like everybody freaking out about whether or not they were going to lose their jobs or no, or be laid off and stuff like that. And so like I was carrying a lot of debt. But I could afford the the payments, so I never really, like, I was never stressing about it, right? So then, one day, one of the Facebook, you know, posts just popped up, and I actually took the the time to read it. Then I just went down the rabbit hole of, like, the FIRE movement. And I was like, all right, while, you know, student loan payments are on, like, deferment and stuff like that, so I was like, all right, I'm putting all my money towards my student loans. I was in, uh, this is gonna, you're gonna, people are gonna critique this, but I, I actually had a universal life insurance policy. <laughs> and I was paying like $150 a month for the insurance policy. And I was like, all right, how can I increase my cash flow? So, I canceled the policy and just took the cash value and threw it all at my debt. I was like, all right, I'm paying all this stuff off. And then I moved everything into my investments. So thanks to 2020, that's really when I started getting into the fire movement. And I also joined the um, Singles and Pursuit of uh, Financial Independence Group. And that's how I met my good friend, Austin. <laughs> yeah so tell us greg do you currently um where would you say you're at on your fire path oh my fire i would say i'm at about maybe like 30 percent of the way there yeah which i think it's pretty good since i like, just started like a year ago and like just in the past year like i increased my net worth like six figures also thanks to the housing market but we could talk about that later <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i totally agree i thanks to the housing market my net worth past six years as well um you know <laughs> hopefully it continues because i'm not i'm not complaining about that and you know there's a lot of discussion about people including their house and their net worth what do you think about that um, I feel like you can include your house and your net worth if it's not your, uh, it's like not your forever home because you can always sell it and downgrade, you know, get to a smaller house or just move locations. Um, so that number, so the cash value in that house is actually worth something, but when it comes to your fire fire number, 
probably not until you're ready to sell the house, right? Because until you're ready to sell the house, like you're not going to get any money from it. So it's good for like net worth, but not for your fire number. What if someone decided to, you know, pull out a HELOC or do a cash out refinance? Um, then like you still like, like you have the cash, which you can invest and then just have whatever um, dividends that it pays pay for your you know, mortgage cost if, if the difference is good enough, right? But I feel like doing that is still risky because like he like can get called by the bank anytime <laughs> and then like the interest rate can change. Um, and then, yeah, then like, yeah, HELOCs. No, go ahead. Yeah, HELOCs are definitely variable interest. I think I, I've seen somewhere that they can go as high as 18%. Yeah, which is you don't want to get you want to you don't want to get caught holding that bag when the when the interest rate jumps. <laughs> <laughs> like right now, yeah, like right now, interest rates are like dirt cheap, right? So people, I feel like people are willing to take on more risk than they need to and then like some people are going to get caught in trouble for sure yeah i absolutely agree yeah it's like um but i'll say it's like even like the smartest people are like taking the biggest risk because they think that they're so smart no isn't that really (laughs) their downfall (laughs) yes Uh, so so tell me more about you know when you when you hit buy what are your your goals like what do you plan on doing once you you hit buy what i want to what i want to do when i fire is have the ability to slow travel and actually enjoy the countries that i'm visiting because like right now i travel at least once or twice a year out of the country but you know, due to work, you can only go for like one or two weeks at a time. And right now, I'm still, you know, still young in my twenties, and my my trips, you know, include me mostly drinking and, you know, doing quick sightseeing, you know, walk around tours and stuff. But being able to actually get um, immersed into like different cultures and stuff would be really great. I think. Oh, so that would be like my number one goal uh, once I hit fire. And then I would also try and like give back to um, give back to Detroit, um, the city that raised me. So if That's I have, awesome. so if I have that uh, no, ability to donate money back or like, have the time to donate my time back, that'd be great. What about I th- you? I think, I think that's awesome. Um, what I want to do once I fire is honestly, I think I want to pursue, you know, being able to be doing this podcast full time. I think this is one of the one of my fire things, just you know, being able to go travel around the country, meeting new people, and and you know, being able to interview them, talking about fire, where they came from, their journey, you know, what life lessons they learned, because you know, this podcast isn't just about fire. It's also about, you know, life and love. Yeah, definitely. So, um, speaking of life, what was your, I guess, what was your life like growing up? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> like, how did that so, shape you into, like, the person you are now to becoming financial independent? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, I... I guess you could say I had a I had a normal childhood. <laughs> um, you know, mom, dad were together, um, living in the same house. Uh, I had one younger brother, an older brother, and an older sister. Uh, you know, most of them are <laughs> they they do their own businesses now. Um, they're pretty smart. Okay. Um, but yeah, so I moved from Baltimore, Maryland, when I was like three to Matthews, North Carolina. 
And that's where I, you know, I grew up until I was 18 and I left for the army. And from, from, you know, Charlotte, I went from here to Georgia for basic training and then from basic training to Kansas. And then I did my first rotation through Korea and oh. it was interesting, nice. but I think, you know, my childhood didn't have as much of an impact on who I am today because of my fire. But I think it was really more, you know, my uh, adolescent years that had a more of a bigger impact on where I wanted to be and how I wanted to be with my finances in the future. Okay. I like that. So uh, what do you think was your, like, motivation for joining the military? That's that's another good question. (laughs) (laughs) Um, You know, at the time I was 17. When I first enlisted, funny enough, you have to when when you're 17, you have to get your parents to sign off on yeah. on you know going into the military. So I, you know, it was the whole patriotism thing. I was in ROTC in high school, and I, I was just like, I want to do the full 20. I want to do my 20 years in the military, <laughs> retire, you know, yeah. get the pension, do that whole thing. But, uh, you know, it's not always what you think it it's cracked up to be. You know, I. I was going in for patriotic reasons and, you know, sometimes your dream job isn't what you dreamt it to be. Yeah. What about you? Um, what, what did your childhood look like that made you want to pursue fire? Uh, well, my childhood, I guess, was no, well, I feel like it was a normal childhood. Uh, well, not normal because, you know, growing up in Detroit, uh, my dad was in the military. Uh, my mom, well, she had a bunch of different jobs. Um, growing up, like she worked at a, a daycare center. Uh, she, she worked at Lux. She worked at Little Caesars Pizza <laughs> or the Domino. She worked at like pizza shops, and then uh, she went and got her degree in finance. Uh, and then uh, my my father passed when I was like, six. Right from uh, you no know, health complications, and you know, from I feel like that was like the starting point of like my like independence because I felt like I really like started like shut down after that. Was like I started like keeping to myself type stuff, right? And uh, so like I was like private and I just watched. You know, so like, I kept to myself, but I like observed everything. Um, so like my grand, like my grandfather, um, watched me a lot. So I feel like he influenced me the most because he was an accountant, and my grandmother was a teacher. And like seeing their lifestyle, like my grandfather drove, uh, his little like his little 1992 Toyota Camry until the day he died. <laughs> Uh, so it was like, like I'm almost 30. He died like five years. So yeah, he drove that car for like 25 years. <laughs> uh, so I felt like that was like the one thing I noticed, like all the little, all the little things that like he would teach me, um, that like, you know, when you're a kid, like you get taught stuff, but you don't really pick up on it back then. And then you're an adult and you're like, damn, that's what he was trying to tell me all those years ago. Right. Um, so it was things like that, like not spending money on like unnecessary things like he had the money to buy new cars and stuff if he wanted to but he was like he would always tell me like i would be like granddad why don't you get a new car like he's like this car works it gets me from point a to b i'm gonna drive this car until the wheels fall off so i feel like like he was like the one person that like molded me uh as a child to like on the concepts of fire without actually knowing what fire was. That's awesome. Now let's get into this question. What are you hoping you can give back to the world from this podcast? Um, what I'm hoping to give back from this podcast is you no know, good entertaining content. And hopefully people will learn something from a different perspective. 
right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So, what do you think? What do you think your goal is for the podcast? You know, to I think just to be able to help one person change their financial future, even in like the smallest way, whether it's you know finding a new book to read or learning about index funds. I think just having like a small change in someone's life, I think that would be enough for me to keep doing this for the rest of my life. Just knowing that I'm making an impact in someone's life. Yes, I agree. I feel like that'd be awesome. And, you know, little, little side money doing something that you actually enjoy would be fantastic. Also, <laughs> whatever I can do to stop working faster, that's what I want to yeah. <laughs> bring. I want to bring people enjoyment from our you know, conversation and education and money. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, in the coming weeks, we're going to have multiple different guests on the show. And we have a lot of great surprises coming up for the, all the people who are out there listening to us right now. Oh, yeah, we've got some very entertaining guests. And it's nice to see, be able to have different perspectives on the dating scene also so we'll get into some of those episodes in the future thank you guys for listening uh comment and they'll give us feedback on how you think you know we, what we should do in the future what we could change and we'll hope to see you next time absolutely and thank you for joining us on this episode of life love and the pursuit of fi and until next time I am your host, Greg Gaskin. And I'm your other host, Austin Colt.